If you'd like to turn to the book of Philippians, as you know, for the last couple of Sundays I've been doing sermons of, of the whole book, some of the shorter books, Galatians and Ephesians, and today we want to look at Philippians. Before we do that, let's bow together and let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet in your house with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask God that you would bless us during this time as we hear from your word, as we sing these songs of praise, as we meet around this table, that you would bless us and you have our hearts and minds open, our ears open to hear what you're wanting to say to us and give us the obedient heart to go forward and accomplish your will. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If I was to talk about how much unrest there is in the world, that would be an understatement, wouldn't it? That everywhere we look, we just constantly see all of the, the lives of people never really being able to find satisfaction, never be able to, to grab hold of something that will keep them afloat in the world that we are going through. And, and we look and we see all of this unrest and the uh, inability of people to get that contentment, and we ask, why? Why can't people get a hold of, of that which is going to help hold them together? There was a gentleman that was diagnosed with a, a certain type of ailment, and the doctor gave him medication, and he asked the doctor how he would be, and the doctor said, I see no reason why you can't have a normal life as long as you don't try to enjoy it. I see very few people enjoying life. I, I don't quite comprehend that or why. Uh, I know there's unrest at times in our lives. Many times there's unrest. But gosh, can't we enjoy life? Can't we grab hold of something that we know that will never let us down and not something but someone? There is so much unrest in churches today. And I have my own idea why that is. I'm not going to go into that. But it's, it's amazing to me that I see Christian people struggling with the same things that non-Christian people struggle with. And, and I don't quite understand that except for the fact that we have strayed away from God and we're trying to find that satisfaction in the things of the world, and it doesn't happen. It never has happened. It's not going to happen. But we think that we might be different, that we might be different. Life, many times, is a matter of attitude, okay? a foundation. We search for happiness, and that's, uh, I won't get into that either, but aren't we aware of the fact that what made us happy six months ago may not make us happy now? So happiness is something that's fleeting back and forth. Happiness is an emotion. It's something that we respond to or those things around us. But contentment and satisfaction in life, folks, is a decision of the will. It's something I decide. It's not just something that happens. And so many times our lives are determined by the circumstances around us. That if we can just be able to do whatever we want to do, go wherever we want to go, get whatever we want to get, that somehow we think that that satisfaction is going to be there for us. Except I know the story of a man that uh, he was a multi-billionaire. He could go anywhere he wanted to go, do anything he wanted to do, buy anything he wanted to buy. And he did it. And while he was going through, because he was searching for this satisfaction, he was searching for some kind of contentment in life, and he continued to spend millions and millions of dollars uh, going everywhere, buying everything, and gosh, if he had billions and billions of dollars, you'd be happy, wouldn't you? You'd be satisfied, wouldn't you? Well, by the time he got done searching all over for this, you know what his conclusion was? Life is not worth living. That life has no purpose. Wow, that flies in the face of our economic God that we have before us, doesn't it? So he, he decided that he needed to look somewhere else. And he did. He finally he started to look to God. And, and eventually he came to the point of realizing that his whole purpose in life was God. Obeying what God has told us. His name was Solomon. His journal was the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, his search for this contentment. And we're not going to be indifferent. If, if we think that we can find this satisfaction in life in the things of this world, we're wasting the years that God has given us. 
that we need to look at things differently, that as Christians we don't have the same mindset as the world. As Christians we don't have the same attitude. We're not supposed to. How much money did Jesus have? Hmm. So we have to look outside of ourselves, outside of this world, to find that contentment we're looking for. And here in this letter in Philippians, Paul is trying to drive home to these people the one little word that we don't really possess in our lives a lot of the time, and that is the word joy. You're right. Did you want to preach the sermon, Roxy? Or? No, I just, she said Jesus. Well, that's where the joy comes from, is through Him, not things, but in His person. So Philippians is a very interesting uh, letter. It's a very interesting church. If you would read it, I, it may vary a little bit as far as translation is concerned, but the word joy is used five times in four chapters. The word rejoice is used 11 times in these four chapters. He wants them to find that joy, because when we find the joy, folks, everything else falls into place. Everything else is going to be okay. Philippians, the, the church of Philippi was not a rich church. They were the poorest church material-wise that Paul ever founded. But whenever he had a, a need in his missionary journeys, they were the first church to respond because of what they possessed in Christ. But like everything else, sometimes things get out of whack, don't they? And if you read Philippians very closely here, we will find a couple of places I'll share with you. We will find that this church is on the verge of splitting. It's on the verge of falling apart. And Paul, while he is in prison in Rome, writes this letter to them saying, find this joy. Get the joy back. And then you're not going to find yourself struggling for the things that you're struggling. What is the number one reason that church is split? Anybody? Selfishness. Got to have my way. It's got to be either done the way I think it should be, or I'm going to take my ball and go home. It's that selfishness. And Paul is trying to get them to understand that. So he begins here by, first of all, saying that we can find that joy through hope. Through hope. Paul is in prison right now. He does not know whether he's going to live or die. He doesn't know whether the Romans are going to put him to death or they're going to set him free. And you know what he says? It doesn't really matter to me. That if I die, I'll go to be with Jesus. If I live, I'll just keep preaching. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But for your sakes, he says, I'll go on living to preach and to teach and to serve God. But we can find the, the joy we're looking for when we redefine the hope that we have. Would you think that Paul might be in some tough circumstances right now? He's in prison. He doesn't know whether he's going to live or die. He doesn't know what's before him. That he is in a house arrest type situation and there's other churches in town and people are talking to, to Paul about different things and there are those people that are supposed to be Christians that are bad-mouthing Paul. That their motives are incorrect. They're trying to, to see that they're a greater preacher than Paul is, whatever it might be. It's kind of like the, the preacher that preached this sermon that he thought was great. And on his way out, he asked one of the church members, how many great preachers do you think there are in the world? And the guy said, one less than you think. It's our pride and our selfishness that gets in the way. And what happens so many times, as Paul is trying to get across to us in his first chapter, is the fact that we allow circumstances to control us. You know what I hear from people too many times? I can't. Or from churches, we can't. Tony Lima, you remember Tony Lima, the golfer? He had a great saying, is when I say I can't, it means I don't want to. The hope that we have is what can give us joy. Paul allowed the circumstances that he encountered to teach him. He didn't let it control him. He had confidence that God was going to provide for him whatever he needed. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He's in prison, and we can get the context of that at another time. But how God gives to us according to his riches and glory. 
that we can see that God will provide, and once we see that, it changes, that we can have this confidence in Jesus, that that hope will bring about the joy that God wants us to have, and we can't allow our circumstances to rob us of that joy, and that's what we do. So many people determine their faith based upon their circumstance. When things are going well, wow, this is great, but when they're not going so well all at once, where's God at? And we allow those circumstances to cloud our vision of what God is doing, what God is accomplishing. There's reasons for our joy with our perseverance and with God's preservation that we can have this joy and hope. In the book of Genesis, one of those great, great stories of Joseph, the example of Joseph and what he went through and, and all the circumstances surrounding him. First of all, he was the favorite son of of his father, but his brothers didn't like him. How many of you know the story of Joseph? They wanted to kill him. Most of them did, but they ended up putting him in uh, slavery with some people going to Egypt. And right away, he, he gets involved with his Potiphar, and he rises to the top, and then Potiphar's wife makes this false accusation about him. He goes to prison. He helps a, a, the butler and the baker, basically, as far as their dreams are concerned, and he is in prison all this time, but he hadn't done anything wrong. And when his brothers come to get food because of the great famine, and finally on the third visit tells us that Joseph let them know it was him, because they had no idea that their brother Joseph was now the top man in Egypt. Now, if you had dealt very badly and tried to harm someone, and all at once they become president of the United States, What's your response going to be when you meet him on the street? Uh-oh. Okay. Genesis 45, I think it is, folks. You read what Joseph says to his brothers. God sent me here. It was God that sent me ahead of you for this very purpose. And he goes about five times, I think, in his whole message to his brothers, and he gives them that, this hope and this joy that he had. It wasn't a matter of his circumstance. It was a matter of his God. It wasn't a matter of what was going on around him. It was a matter of what was going on inside of him that Joseph could see was so important, so essential to this joy that he could see God's hand in situations. He could see God's hands in the circumstances of life. See, what happens is that those circumstances seem to blur God to us. We look at God through the circumstances instead of looking at the circumstances through God's eyes. And that's where the joy comes back. That's where the hope comes is there for us. Anybody know who this lady is? I would be surprised if you did, but her name is Fanny Crosby. When Fanny was a very, very young baby. She had an infection in her eye. Uh, I think she was like six weeks old, and the doctor gave her the wrong medicine, and it blinded her for the rest of her life. She became a mother of three. She also wrote over 800 hymns. In fact, you might be surprised to know that some of the hymns in our hymnal that uh, have her name to them, but there's other names she used so that she could get more hymn, hymns in the hymnals that we have today. Years later, when she was asked about this doctor that had blinded her, she bore no hard feelings. In fact, she said, if I could meet him, I'd thank him. Because that's what opened the door for me to write all these hymns. Some people complain about their lot in life, and he said, and other people just build upon it. That is the joy there. I mean, you if you read, some, there's 17, I believe, if I remember right, in our hymnal that were written by Fanny Crosby, and there have been a lot dropped from these newer hymnals that have come out. But it, it, she saw this blindness as a gift from God that helped her to see God in a greater way as she wrote these hymns. How? What would your response be right now if you were blinded for the rest of your life? After you complained for six months, what would your attitude be? See, she saw the joy. She saw God in this. She saw God giving her the best life that she would have never had. Paul wanted the thorn in the flesh to be removed. Whatever, I believe that was blindness. We won't go into that. That he had these terrible headaches from malaria. And he asked God, well, what a great preacher I could be if you would just get rid of this physical problem that I had. And God's answer was, no, my grace is sufficient. 
And then Paul says, I glory in my weaknesses because when I am weak, then I'm strong. The more I learn to depend upon God, we have this joy because of hope. And there is a great, great connection here, folks, between gratitude and hope. Gratitude and joy. That thankful people have that joy. Thankful for what we have. We spend a lot of time complaining about what we don't have. But what about what we do have? How we be so grateful and thankful? And that's where the joy comes in. Paul crowds all the joy into his heart. He takes all the circumstances and pushes them away. And it brings him courage and conviction and contentment. Many, many years ago, in the Thirty Years' War, that back in the 1600s, there was a preacher named Martin Winkert. And he was a preacher in Saxony, Germany. And folks, in one year, the year of 1637, he performed 4,600 funerals. All these people being killed in 30 years war. And in the midst of all of this going on, he wrote this hymn. Now we thank we all our God with heart, hands, and voices. What wondrous things has done in whom his world rejoices. After doing 4,600 funerals, he could write about rejoicing, about this great God that gives us so many reasons to rejoice. That's because he saw the joy that was there and didn't let circumstances harm that. So when Paul begins here in Philippians, he says in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. Always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Hope that he had. The joy that he had. And we can have the same joy that Paul had through the hope. He continues on in chapter 2 and says that joy will come through humility. His expectation. Now, this is the, the first uh, implication by Paul that something isn't right in the church of Philippi. Let's read those first four verses of chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. What is he attacking here? That's what he's doing. I mean, he is driving the stake home in the hearts of some, some of those people. He is attacking their selfishness. Be humble. Who do you think you are, Paul says? Is, is there any encouragement to be united with Christ? Well, absolutely. Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship with the Spirit and tenderness and compassion? Then, he says, make my joy complete by doing what? Be united. Get the selfishness out of the way. Understand who and what we are in Christ and be humble. These are, this is an intense appeal in the original language from Paul. That he understands that things aren't what they ought to be. Look at yourself today, folks, and read these verses. Are you like-minded with your brothers and sisters? Do you have the same love? Are you one in spirit? Are we one in, in purpose? Have selfishness left? And our, our goal is now to consider each other more important than ourselves. The example of humility that he uses here, folks, verse 5 and, and 11, uh, that's a passage here that I'm sure that we have been familiar with in many times past, but it's a passage that Paul says the example of humility is he talks about who Jesus is here, but notice what he says in verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that as Christ Jesus. That he was God in the flesh, yet he was willing to let that go. To come to earth, to humble himself, to empty himself, and die upon a cross. And then God exalted him. You know, is that humility first, then exalted later? Same thing as with us. That humility first, we have nothing to brag about. He says to look who Jesus is and what he did and where he's at and who he is and why he is. 
Does Paul want us to admire this example of Jesus? The answer is no. He wants us to imitate it. To humble ourselves in front of other people. You know, I, one time I was talking to, to another preacher and he said, well, I don't know that Jesus wants us to let people walk all over us. And I said, I think that's exactly what he says. That's what he allowed. Because he trusted that God was going to take care of it. That we don't have to defend ourselves. That God is there for us. And he wants us to imitate the example that Jesus has given for us. And he gives us this example and this expression of humility. There are two people that he's going to talk about here. Timothy and Epaphroditus. He says there's no one else like Timothy. That Timothy has a great, greater concern for the people of the church than he does for himself. Epaphroditus brings an offering. If we put the book of Acts together with Philippians, Epaphroditus brings an offering to Paul to help him continue his ministry. And somewhere along the line, Epaphroditus gets sick, almost to the point that he dies because of what he has done for Paul. Read it. Paul is very concerned that he's going to die. But in the midst of this, both of these people were willing to suffer for the sake of others, put others first. That's humility. Humility, folks, is... I guess I would say that humility is that I am so secure in who I am that I'm not threatened by anybody else. That we react to that which scares us, which we're afraid of. And usually when there's, there's problems between people is because there's a threat. There's a threat. I, I think I put it in the bowl on the back of the prayer list today. Well, you can talk about God all you want, but you bring up Jesus and all at once, there's going to be a reaction. There are going to be people who get upset and they're going to get angry. Why? Because they're afraid of Him. They are scared to death of this Jesus because of who He is. Well, that's what we do with people. But when I understand who I am and what I am in Christ, I, I'm not going to be threatened by people around him. I'm secure. Moses was called the humblest man on earth. Jesus was by far a, a, very, a man of great humility because he knew who he was. And that is what we need to understand. Humility will go a long, long way in bringing a church together to accomplish God's will. He speaks of joy through holiness. Chapter 3. If you were to ask Paul, list the top ten things that are most important to you in your life. Number 10 would be Jesus. Number 9 would be Jesus. Number 8 would be Jesus. All the way up. Because nothing else matters. And we will ultimately, folks, find ourselves in a position in our life, the same thing's going to be true. Nothing else is going to matter but Him. And what I have done with Him, what I have believed about Him, where I have put Him, in my life, we always talk about trying to find a place in our life for Jesus. That's incorrect. We're trying to find a place in His life. That we want to be a part of His life. And through holiness, something that does not seem to be a, a major thing in the lives of church people anymore. Well, I'm saved by grace. We, I just saw a video at camp yesterday about this. If I'm saved by grace, I can go out and do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. That's called cheap grace. Again, D.G. Bonhoeffer's book, The Call to Discipleship, you need to, to read that first half of that book at least as he talks about that very thing. Holiness through conversion, first of all, is the spirit that makes me holy. It's not something I can do. His possession causes me to be holy. There is a big, big difference between being religious and being Christian. You know where religion comes from? Satan. He's trying to convince me that to be accepted by God by the things that I do. By being presentable to God by the things that I do. Christianity is I'm saved by grace. It comes from God. I can't, I can't earn God's faith. I cannot. There was a song uh, by Third Day, one of my favorite groups. And I, oh, I'm not singing, but I saw a few of you get started to believe. Right. Beautiful song. Nothing compares to the glory of knowing you, Lord. Are you familiar with that song? Oh my goodness. What a song. Nothing compares. Paul says the same thing here in Philippians. I don't know if that's where they drew it from Paul in chapter 3 or not. But nothing compares to the glory of knowing you, Lord. That's, that's the, the song and the fantastic. The words are right there. We need to understand that same thing that nothing compares 
to knowing Him, to continue. Paul says the same thing here in chapter 3, one of these great, great passages of the Bible, verses 7 and following especially, that in chapter 3, chapter, verses 1 and following, he talks about his religious heritage. That he compares that to being rubbish. Verse 8. Let's read chapter 3, verse 8 together if you would. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. He compares knowing Christ to His religious heritage. He called it what? Verse 8, I consider them rubbish. Now, there's one place that the NIV is trying to be nice. Anybody want to guess what that word is? Manure. King James calls it dumb. Close to translation. So if you want to take my car and my house and my bank account and my clothes and all this stuff and you consider them what? Manure to knowing Christ. Folks, have we put that much emphasis on Jesus? Have we put that much importance upon Him that absolutely nothing else is going to matter? But knowing Him, and the word know there it means to know by experience. He didn't say know about Him. He wants to experience the same life that Christ went through. He wants that same thing to holiness. He presses forward, he says. He's looking ahead, not behind. That God has forgiven him. And now he's going to the mountaintop. He wants to, to have the greatest experience with Jesus that he can possibly have. He strives for that perfection, which means maturity. He's not satisfied with anything else. Does that describe us? That we're never going to be satisfied with our relationship with Jesus until it's complete. That we have surrendered everything there is to Him. Or are we content just to be church members and religious and sometimes say the right thing? Where are my desires of my heart? Toward worldly things? Really? Or toward God? If we want that joy, we are going to have to desire the holiness that only Christ can gives us. And finally, in chapter 4, he's going to say joy through harmony. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 2. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Seneca to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have consented at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Judea and Seneca are splitting the church. These two women are. There's some kind of argument between them that they won't let go. And it's destroying the church. See, the, what's that second word in verse 2? Plead. Ladies, I'm down on my knees begging you to get this problem solved. Because I don't care if when we have a problem with someone, it never remains just the two of us. So we start getting sides, don't we? We start talking to people, and, and what's happening, that's what's happening to the church. I wonder, and, and I really guess I don't want to know, but I wonder how many people in this world have died lost because of churches that were split over some of the most ridiculous, yes, stupid things. I've ever heard. I wonder. I wonder. What great power is available to the church when we're united. And united doesn't mean that I get along with Danny Tinker as long as you stay on your side of the church, I'll stay on mine. That's unity, isn't it, Danny? No, that's peaceful coexistence. That's not unity at all. That sin is what God calls it. And He is pleading. How many, how many people have rejected Christianity because they hear from Christians the same arguments that they hear from the world? The mindset doesn't seem to be any different than it does to non-Christians. And, and I can tell you folks that if I'm fighting the world all week long, the last thing that I'm concerned about is going to the church and fighting the same struggles that I have to fight with the world. This is supposed to be different. 
that we are united. We have the same spirit around us. And we lose that joy because of that very thing. Joy is tuning in to what God is doing around you. What you see is happening. How He is drawing us together as one so we can accomplish the, the work and see that the world is through His eyes, not the circumstances. William Randolph Hearst was a very well-known man that was a very rich man and he loved to collect rare art treasures. And he, he saw one in a, a picture one time and he wanted it. And he got this gentleman to work for him and he said, you go find this, I don't care what it costs, we have to go, how much time it takes, I want this one artwork. And the man searched and searched and after months and months and months, he located it, finally. It was in one of Hearst's warehouses. He already owned it. And so how it got lost. I would suggest to you that if we don't have the joy in Jesus that we desire, we have it. We have to go looking for it. It's inside of us. His Spirit is there. Fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5. One of those, I think, is joy. We possess that joy. We just need to allow God to develop that joy inside of us. If contentment is what we seek, we already possess it in Christ. That true joy is to be where God wants me to be, doing what God wants me to do. To letting go of myself and surrendering myself to God. To let go of the world being transformed by God. And letting go of the past and pressing on toward the goal and loving my brother and sister in Christ the way Christ has loved me. Father, as we read this book of Philippians, we don't have that joy that we desire because our lives are still about us and not you. I pray that we would sit and read the words of Paul writes and the, the great desire he has for this church of Philippi to be strong, united, and have that joy. And how he desired each person in that church to have that joy. I just pray, God, that we would not allow the world to rob us of that, that we would look to you and keep our eyes on you and, and look at our lives through your eyes, that we might truly have that joy that you have promised us through your Son and through your Spirit, is my prayer in Jesus' name.